So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Critical Legal Talk series. I'm Alexis Alvarez Nakagawa, lecturer in law at Queen Mary and the host of the, of the Critical Legal Talk series, which are co-organized by the law department and the Institute uh, uh, and the IHSS, the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at Queen Mary. Uh, in collaboration with the Group of Critical Studies in Politics, Law and Society, or PODES in Spanish at the University of Buenos Aires. We have a very special guest today. As you know, we have the immense privilege of having Professor Wendy Brown with us. Uh, Professor Brown is widely acknowledged as one of the most influential US American political theorists today. Uh, her work has focused on the history of political thought, political economy, continental philosophy, uh, cultural theory, and critical legal theory as well, as, uh, as you know. You probably know as well that some of her best known works are State of Injury, published in 1995, Regulating Aversion in 2006, Wall State, One in Sovereignty uh, in 2010, and her two main studies, of uh, neoliberalism's assault on democratic institutions entitled uh, Undoing the Demos, published in 2015 and in the ruins of neoliberalism in 2019. In today's lecture, Professor Brown will present her new work on reparative democracy. After that, we will open the floor for questions from all of you. Let me say uh, before starting that this event that this seminar will be recorded and will be posted online at QMUL's, at Queen Mary's uh, and Policy's web pages after the event. So Professor Brown, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's really great to have you here with us and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and um, I will describe what I'm going to do and then do it. Uh, what I'm going to do this afternoon is make a case for what I am provisionally calling reparative democracy. By this term, I do not mean restoring liberal or representative democracy to a mythical former splendor, nor am I primarily concerned with reparations whether to people or places brutalized or exploited under past regimes. Rather, my argument is that the democratic practices and democratic ethos that we require today must be relentlessly and radically reparative in relation to both past and present ways of life that are damaging future human and planetary well-being. This orientation changes what democracy means and entails, including democracy's temporalities, its ontologies, and its spatialities. So in what follows, I'll briefly open the problem of the reparative. Then I'm going to very briefly tour what I'll call the crumbling ground of actually existing democracy. Adam Bray, reparative democracy, and then reflect on one instance of its emergence today. I'm just getting rid of something that's on my screen. Okay, what we know, the climate and biodiversity emergency and its manifest imbrication with human inequalities of every kind is a colossal indictment of past and present modes of human living, governing, provisioning, relating to one another and to other life forms. Western civilization, especially, but not only it, uh, Euro-American modernity and its spawn, colonialism and capitalism, appears now as something of an unmitigated disaster. This makes our present task that of unflinching critique. Critique not just of manifest wrongs, but of inherited understandings of politics and economy, human and other than human, nature and culture, agency, science, life, consumption, cohabitation, and well being. If Earth systems and science studies scholars grasped decades ago this need to rethink fundamental paradigms of knowledge and practice, 
social and political theorists have been strangely slower to arrive. But as we do, here is our predicament. The emergency is upon us, alarm sirens scream, yet we must reckon with all that brought us here, historiographies, ontologies, epistemologies, and more. So there's no time to think, yet no choice but to think deeply, differently, that is, to engage in critique. We can't just promulgate reversals and inversions. Socialism for capitalism, nature for culture, vitalism for inertness, small for big, local for global, plants for animals, sovereignty for empire, indigeneity for colonialism, dependency for autonomy, all of these are the very modernist binaries that we need to put into question. Moreover, the most basic assumptions and associations have been disrupted by the current conjuncture. From freedom's link with emancipation or personal license to revolutionary dreams anchored exclusively by human lives and labor. Infinite growth and abundance, enlightenment, productivism, sovereignty, and more all appear now as riddled with blindness and hubris. In political ecologist Pierre Charbonnier's elegant formulation, we inherit a world that no available political category is designed to manage. A condition, he adds, that severs us from the past and the future as we had imagined it up till now. He thoughtfully names this condition one of historic loneliness. But there's a paradox inside this loneliness to which Charbonnier does not attend. The climate crisis radically unmoors us from received political coordinates and landscapes, yet, as eco-social theorist Andreas Volkers reminds us, any future we make now will forever bear the residuals of the extraction, production, consumption practices of the last two centuries. In this paradox, we are at once thrown from our intellectual and political inheritances, yet materially ensnared in the histories they set in motion. A second paradox then, Never in history has there been a more obvious need for total revolution, yet gone is the prospect of a revolutionary break with the past, of Aufheben that carries forward the good and leaves behind the bad. Not only will the effluence and emissions of the past two centuries linger long and heavy, they have future lives on and above the earth, for which monsoon floods, wildfires, droughts, species collapse, ocean life with bellies full of plastics are simultaneously metaphors and practical events. Toxic emission and debris, unprecedentedly ubiquitous, permeating and agentic, participate now in making futures experienced as rushing toward rather than opening before us. Futures to navigate or survive rather than anticipate or craft. Futures envisioned as a narrowing tunnel rather than expanding horizon, approached in the mode of damage control rather than those old revolutionary tropes, natality, rebirth, renewal. For Folkers, whom I just mentioned, the temporal orientation of critique itself is altered by the crisis of what he calls fossil modernity. All elements of modernist critique, he suggests, have lost their prime source of nourishment, the open future once facilitated by fossil fuels. This feature of fossil modernity, yes, wrought by and plumping empires and their beneficiaries, also severs critique decisively from utopia. Not because all possible futures are necessarily dystopian, but simply because no planetary life will ever be free of what fossil modernity unleashed. There is only what anthropologist Annette Singh calls the arts of living on a damaged planet. These are arts that include critique and theory, not just tiny houses, climate justice, or the wily ways of fungi. This is as true of the politics of the post-colony as of rivers fouled with cadmium, selenium, and arsenic from mountaintop mining runoff, or plant and animal microbes learning to metabolize 
plastic. We will end fossil fuel use, or it will end us, but fossil modernity shapes every aspect of every possible future now, such as the unique history that the Anthropocene set in motion and why we still need the term, whatever its limits. Thus, Folkers concludes, critique at this juncture must become reparative in orientation and form. Reparative critique, I want to suggest, bears a profoundly different ethos and orientation from critique bound to progress, systematicity, totality, and utopia. Reparative critique is humbled by past errors of anthropocentrism, imminence, dialectics, rationality, and standing the world on its head. This humility does not weaken critique's radical impulses. It's boring into orders of power to achieve incandescent expose of those powers and their effects. But it does bring critique closer to the ground, making it radically material, divesting it of historical meta narratives, toppling many of its idols, anachronizing its favored tropes, and replacing the notion of man at its center with imbricated earthly life, or what Bruno Latour calls terrestrials. Let's see what happens when we bring this orientation in critique to the problem child that is democracy today. Constitutional nation state democracy, whether one wants to call it liberal or representative or bourgeois, is in crisis. It is a crisis that I believe indexes an overdetermined historical exhaustion of the form. Here we face not only actually existing democracies, rickety and challenged present, and not only its poisonous and lingering legacies of violences and exclusions, both human and non-human, but its growing haplessness before global powers and problems including its constitutive failure to be able to deal with radically imperiled, imbricated earthly life. The most familiar face of the contemporary crisis of constitutional democracy features attacks on its principles, processes, and institutions by autocrats, plutocrats, neo-fascists, authoritarians, and religious and ethno-nationalists. The legitimacy and success of these attacks, of course, builds from four decades of neoliberal effects, including extremes of wealth and poverty, declining prospects for middle and working class populations, enormous demographic displacements and migrations, the intensifying control of subjects, industries, and states by novel formations and operations of finance, and a form of governing reason that torched the very meaning of the common good, replaced equality with principles of winners and losers, flooded politics more generally with market values and techniques, and above all, equated social justice with totalitarian statism. This portrait of constitutional democracy in peril is familiar enough. However, liberal democracy is also challenged today from the left, with anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-imperial, feminist, queer, ecological, and neo-Marxist critique. These challenges indict Euro-Atlantic democracy's long record of failed inclusion and power sharing, its faux neutrality, its inability to deliver even equal treatment before the law. These critiques identify modern democracy's emergence in and with patriarchy, slavery, genocide, empire, and capital, with the persistence of white moneyed thumbs on the scales of justice, and with carceral states that punish the poor and the marginal, protect the privilege, and ransack the global commons for the few. Framing liberal democracy as a racket for the powerful at home and abroad, these critiques shine light on the exclusions, the supremacisms, the violences of actually existing democracies, excavate their deplorable histories, and cast worship of democracy's idealized form as cover for gendered and racial capitalism's savage ways. 
Then there is life beyond the demos, non-human life. Its lack of place in modern Western democracy was an absence the West was so proud of for so long, part of its imagined superiority to all those it colonized, enslaved, and postulated as closer to nature. Of course, legal standing for rivers, forests, or threatened species, constitutionalizing nature altogether, these aim at correcting this exclusion. But even these practices do not reach to the sequester of the demos in democracy from what sustains it that we find in Western democracy's origin and development prior to modernity, prior to its entwinement with liberalism and liberalism's disavowals of interconnected life. Democracy was not only conceived and practiced historically as anthropocentric, this anthropocentrism endures. It's inscribed in democracy throughout its history through a cascade of nature culture binaries that render the rule of the people always partial. That is, there has always been a part of earthly life, both human and non-human, that to paraphrase Ranciere, is no part of democracy or democracies. Let me probe this a little more closely. Democracy in the West, as we all know, emerges at the site of the ancient Greek differentiation between polis and oikos, politics and economy, city and outside lands, free and unfree. While the big Greek thinkers were all wary of democracy, we plucked it from their disregard only to remain saddled with this sequester of politics from life both social and earthly, and hence with practices of political freedom ruling ourselves that rest on, yet depoliticize, social, economic, and ecological relations of subjection. The birth of democracy in the West thus semantically and practically excludes the politics of households, countryside, production, extraction, and human relations with the non-human world. As such, it naturalizes domination in each domain, disavows the dependencies they embody, and builds a figure of democratic man with slaves and beasts as its premise, not merely its opposite. The foundational Western splitting of politics from everything arrayed under necessity and nature, non-human life, human production and reproduction, delivers both an exclusionary demos and an irresponsible form of kratia, rule. One cut off from and self-authorized to violate the sources of its own sustenance. This makes ontologies and practices of Western democracy co-responsible with the voraciousness of capitalism for the histories of damage to human and non-human life that have now reached an emergency pitch. Where are we then? Democracy attacked directly by right and left, eroded and corroded by less visible forces, unable to harness contemporary powers or address many of the predicaments they create, is also so thickly entwined with foundational and contingent exclusions, conceits, neglects, that it would be understandable if we believed the very concept of democracy deserved to die. However, we rarely do. Or even as we think it in one mood, we fret anxiously about democracy's imperiled state in another. If this attachment is not mere fetish, or failure of imagination, but commitment to political self-rule, then what lies before us is the project of reparative democracy, to which I now turn. Repair is a ubiquitous notion in social and political thought and practice today. It appears in critical race and post-colonial theory and political theory and queer cultural studies, in information technology studies, in new media and law. The intellectual turn accompanies a practical one comprising racial reparations, post-conflict reconciliation and restitution, ecological restoration, and even the right to repair consumer environmental movement. Some have identified the turn to repair with what they call broken world thinking, where, to quote, 
Coordinates of erosion, breakdown, and decay replace modernist ones of novelty, growth, and progress. But I don't believe that repair is a term de jour simply because the world is a mess or because, to quote Latour, critique has run out of steam. Nor do I think that the turn to repair indexes retrenchment or defeat in making a radically different future. To the contrary, as I'll suggest, the changes called for in a reparative politics reach deeper than those of a modernist left revolutionary agenda. If revolution can no longer be imagined to redeem or overcome the past, then attending to enduring damages and adopting a reparative orientation toward them is fundamental to new world making. A reparative politics neither collapses helplessly nor fatalistically before the immense damages of Euro-Atlantic modernity, nor does it minimize these damages to pretend that we might simply overleap them. In these regards, it is a radically untheological stance. It's also important to mark the difference between the term reparative and the more familiar and freighted one, reparations. Reparation, a noun, is a concrete practice of restitution or redress or atonement for historical wrongs conditioning lives in the present. Reparative, an adjective, reorients and potentially resignifies the noun it modifies. It resets its conventional spatial and temporal coordinates. Reparations are, are restitutive deeds or acts relating to historical wrongs, moral, political, economic. Reparative politics signals an orientation, purpose, or ethos for making different futures. It's ongoing and unfinished as fossil modernity and legacies of democratic exclusions and violences are ongoing and unfinished. Its temporalities are thus different from those of reparations, though of course it may include them. Reparative democracy would entail, first, self-repair of and from democracy's long troubling histories, and not only its very recent ones. Democracy's meaning, principles, and practices would be transmogrified, transmogrified through tethering the demos both to the non-human and to histories of damage that bear on the present and the future. These tethers would alter, uncomfortably for some, the meanings and temporalities of justice. Justice in the Western tradition, not just within liberalism, but from Plato to Douglas, Marx to Fanon, is immediate, presentist. The rallying cry, what do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now, is a signature of this immediacy. Justice in this tradition, the, the conventional one, also strives for a level of institutionalization that's at odds with responsiveness to agentic elements of the past in the present, to the interdependency of life forms, and to future thriving for multiple species. In reparative democracy, the immediate needs and demands of the present cannot dictate the terms of justice. This is a cannot that challenges liberalism's centering of justice on rights and distribution, as opposed to sustenance and regeneration amidst interdependence. Of course, justice in reparative democracy must be alert to the extreme stratifications in fossil modernity, especially disparate demographic effects of climate change, resource depletions, water contamination, and decarbonizing and degrowth projects. But this alertness, while important, does not reach to the divide between social justice projects and ecological repair that is built on that old culture nature divide. It neither incorporates non-human life into justice parameters, nor recasts social ecological relations as a reparative practice. In addition to justice, reparative democracy would alter valences and practices of freedom, both individual and political. Freedom would shed its identification with sovereignty and autonomy, 
and its disavowals of all the powers, ripple effects, and differential histories and positionings that bear on freedom's exercise. Freedom would also lose its presentist ethos. To mobilize human capacities for democratic ecological repair, freedom would have to take shape as relational, responsive, and responsible with both past and future always on its horizons. Social and political freedom wouldn't lose their foundation in our singular species capacities to craft or govern collective and individual power for chosen ends, but this could not be further from license or from entitlement limited by the human harm principle. Reparative democracy also entails a new iteration of robust political equality. The voiced and the unvoiced must not count differentially. And concentrations of economic and social power must be vigilantly restrained from either amplifying or suppressing any part of this expanded democratic subject and constituency. Still, political equality is about more than counting or who counts, it exceeds measure by individual units. In a reparative mode, political equality must address deep histories of political inequalities, racial, gendered, regional, hemispheric, and between human and non-human that bear on discursive norms and agendas in democratic spheres. Political equality also requires access to material prerequisites to political participation, adequate food, shelter, knowledge, education, and above all protection from violence. And it requires understanding in order to enfranchise life forms that democracy has previously not bothered with. Earthworms, coral reefs, forests, bee colonies, and more. These are but very small tastes of the reorientations demanded by what I'm calling reparative democracy. But I want to suggest we shouldn't look for their emergence from the pens of political theorists or from legal reformers. Rather, we find adumbrations, whispers of them today, in popular uprisings. Captured in the chant, this is what democracy looks like, born in the 1999 World Trade um, Organization protests, reprised in countless uprisings, sit-ins, pickets, op occupations since. The chant celebrates popular voice and non-institutionalized assembly while dodging populist flirtations with demagogic leaders or an authoritarian spirit. In making demands for shelter, healthcare, clean air and water, education, livable wages or freedom from racial and gendered violence and demands to protect rivers, forests, oceans, endangered species of every kind, these occupations and uprisings contest that sequestration of politics from life, social, economic, intimate, and ecological life that I suggested is at the very foundation of the Western notion of the political and hence the democratic. In seizing the mantle of democracy for what is not yet and calling not only for more democracy, but for democracy to be more, these formations limb a democratic imaginary bound to reparative common futures. Their enactments of new democratic constituencies and coordinates beyond the human, beyond the nation state, beyond capital, colonial power, and their exploits. Let me now turn to one instance of such a call. And it will take me just a moment to share my screen. Oops. We are. Top City is the name given by opponents to a proposed 170 acre, 123 million dollar police and fire training site in Atlanta's South River Forest. The forest is known as the Wilani Forest by the Muskegee, the original inhabitants of the land. The controversial project 
a mock-up you can see here, features a village, a school, a nightclub, a burn tower, roadways for high-speed chases, a helicopter pad, indoor and outdoor shooting ranges, bomb detonation, and explosion test areas. Cop City has met protests since plans for it were made public three years ago. Opposition comes from local and national racial justice organizations, ecological and conservation groups, lawyers' guilds, area schools, neighborhood, church, and community associations, and many random souls. The project gained international attention in January 2023 when forest protector Tortuguita Terran was shot dead by Atlanta police adding the United States to the list of nations worldwide responsible for killing more than 2,000 ecological activists in the past decade. In April 2023, an autopsy report established that Tortuguita was shot 57 times with his hands in front of him. The officer wounded in the assault, originally alleged to have been shot by Tortuguita, turned out to have been shot by another officer and five officers are now known to have riddled Tortuguita's body with bullets. On the day the first autopsy report was released, Mayor Dickens, the mayor of Atlanta at that time, gathered with a group of black political leaders and civil servants to publicly reaffirm commitment to building Cop City. Two months later, the city council would do the same, following a 17-hour hearing in which hundreds of constituents implored the council to halt the project. The council voted one to four to add $30 million more to funding Cop City. The forest Tortuguita died trying to protect features a long history of ignominy and violence. Muskegee people were forcibly driven out by white settlers in the 19, 1830s, who then cleared parts for growing cotton, including one very large plantation. The forest was a civil war battleground and for much of the 20th century, hosted two different carceral institutions, a minimum security federal honor farm and the Atlanta prison farm. Both, both were sites of forced and unpaid labor, sexual violence, including rape of black female inmates, and especially harsh treatment and conditions for black prisoners. One part of the forest was also a city dump and contains relics of dismantled buildings and like Atlanta's old library and retired school buses. In recent decades, the Atlanta Police Department has used the dump and especially the school bus for an informal practice firing range. In short, this patch of forest has not been pristine for centuries. Relics, residues, and ghosts of violent indifference to human and non-human life are littered and layered throughout. And now it hosts dozens of self-anointed forest protectors, of which Tortuguita was one. Nor is the forest old growth forest. Large parts were clear cut and have regrown. The land for Cop City abuts a youth detention center whose inmates are mostly black young men. It is also adjacent to a poor, predominantly black part of unincorporated Kalb County, one whose residents have no representation on the Atlanta City Council because the area is unincorporated. They were thus barred from participating in a referendum on the project initiated last year. The Southeast metro area more generally includes a crumbling infrastructure, landfills, polluting industrial complexes, a prison reentry facility, a high school with a 56% graduation rate, and a federal medium security prison notorious for deplorable conditions, violence, and corruption. In short, the Cop City land was easy prey, while the project itself constitutes another body and soul blow to the adjacent poor Black neighborhoods. More history. 
In 2017, years before the project was conceived, the Atlanta Planning Department set in motion permanent preservation of the Wilani Forest. In March 2021, 200 acres were approved for this and more yet was designated as a large forested park. One month later, however, then Mayor Atlanta of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms said that as an answer to rising crime, 150 acres would become the police and fire training facility. In fact, Atlanta's crime rates were not rising significantly. Property crime had fallen significantly over the past decade, with one brief exception. In the wake of Rayshard Brooks' murder by Atlanta police, which came just weeks, I'm sorry, there we are, um, just weeks after George Floyd's murder in summer 2020, Atlanta was seized by angry protests for the first time since the black moderate political machine had formed to govern this city in the early 1960s. The 2021 unveiling of plans to build Cop City, following a year of furious Black Lives Matter organizing, meant that mobilization against it formed quickly. And from the beginning, as I said, the mobilization combined forest protection, environmental justice, racial justice, and resisting intensification of Atlanta policing. And from the beginning, the movement has been met with exceptional force and juridical harshness, the latter coming from local courts, the FBI, and the Biden White House. Cutting down trees and intense policing and incarceration, however, are only two tiny threads of the story and why the protest has become such a powerful site of reparative ecological democracy. But let us dwell with the trees for a moment. Atlanta is known as the city in a forest. It has the highest percentage of tree canopy of any major metropolitan area in the United States. The canopy is not just pretty, it's essential to the health of city inhabitants, especially as climate change continues to make Southern summers hotter. Natural forests, as opposed to hapless, if well-meant, mass planning endeavors, are vital for trapping air pollutants. Atlanta's forests remove approximately 20 million pounds annually. They're also vital for absorbing CO2, releasing oxygen, stemming storm-induced flooding and erosion, and cooling the surrounding areas. Neighborhoods adjacent to the forest may be up to four degrees Celsius cooler than the city. Atlanta's forests are already jeopardized by sprawling development, increasingly spearheaded by large private equity investment groups, about which more in a minute. And what is called forest fragmentation, the forest is the dark green part, the, the uh, cleared or, or, or built upon areas are the white parts. What is called forest fragmentation, chopping forests into ever smaller disconnected pieces, devastates biodiversity in remaining forest. No surprise then that in 2017, the Atlanta Planning Department designated the South River Forest as one of the four major lungs of the city, leading to the permanent preservation proposal. So the South River area that is going to be cleared for Cop City is in the lower right-hand corner. Um, Atlanta itself is right in the middle. Um, and then these other forested areas, especially the top two, are fairly wealthy um, areas, uh, suburban areas of Atlanta. Atlanta is a city unique in the American South for what is called the Atlanta Way, an incredibly enduring and comfortable coalition brokered in the early 1960s between a moderate mixed race city government and black and white business elites. More recently, it is a city where massive amounts of global tech, entertainment, real estate, and predatory finance capital have become chief economic drivers of suburban expansion and development of the city as a whole. Enormous quantities of private finance also pour into politics, policing, and mobilization of the juridical system. 
if there is a current ground zero in the United States for the nexus of de-democratizing financialization, racialized securitization and incarceration, land and home dispossession among the poor, ecological destruction, and weaponization of the judiciary against dissent, Atlanta may well be that ground zero. Here is how this goes. The most surveilled city in the nation, Operation Shield connects more than 13,000 public and private security cameras across the city to the Atlanta Police Department. This is more cameras per capita than anywhere in the United States. Unsurprisingly, Black Atlantans are surveilled at nearly three times the rate of whites. Selling, installing, and networking these cameras is Motorola, Mo Motorola Solutions, which also sells security products to U.S. prisons and detention facilities for use at the U.S.-Mexico border and to Israel for use in West Bank settlements at the wall and at checkpoints. Motorola is owned by Silver Lake Management, one of the largest tech-focused private equity firms in the world. Silver Lake's portfolio of companies employs over 500,000 human beings and generates almost 300 billion in annual revenue. In addition to provisioning Atlanta with surveillance equipment and contracts, Silver Lake funds through the Atlanta Police Foundation an exchange program between Atlanta's police and the Israeli Defense Force to share best practices of securitization. Also in Silver Lake Management's portfolio is Shadowbox Studios, formerly Black Hall Studios, one of the largest soundstage operations in the world with locations in LA, London, and Atlanta. Shadowbox, now owned by Commonwealth Private Equity, is poised to take another bite of the Wilani Forest. In a complex land swap deal, it plans to clear 40 acres of forest to build the largest movie production in the US, comprising 2 million square feet, 31 sound stages, and a private airfield. So the um, area that it's planning to clear is the uh, is the both the blue area and the pink area, which it's added into the arrangement. And then Cop City is over to its left. So that's pretty much a wipeout of the entire forest. Hence the protest slogan: "Stop Cop City, Stop Hollywood Dystopia." Notwithstanding the 2017 Planning Department forest preservation proposals and substantial local opposition to the project, Cup City has, as I've suggested, been repeatedly ratified and defended by city government. It's also defended by the city's daily paper, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which is owned by Cox Enterprises, a privately held global conglomerate. Cox itself donated 10 million to Cop City and its CEO is a major fundraiser for the project. The paper has editorialized repeatedly in favor of Cop City, which brings us to the private funding and contracting for Cop City. The nonprofit Atlanta Police Foundation began dreaming of Cop City in 2019 and in 2021 pledged 60 million from its own fundraising to build the facility. The city of Atlanta, on the other hand, promised the foundation 30 million for the project and doubled that later to 67 million. The police department already receives one third of the city's annual $220 million budget, but the Atlanta Police Foundation, oops, like its cousins everywhere in the country, only much richer, permits the police force to do and buy more without the accountability and oversight that city-funded activities require. For example, the foundation provided $500 bonuses to every Atlanta police officer just a week after the Rayshard Brooks shooting, and it also funds much of Operation Shield. Most importantly, its trustees and donors comprise a rich list of global corporate and financial entities, ranging from JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, 
Wells Fargo, Amazon, and UPS to scores of global law and consultancy firms, Fortune 500 re retail, real estate, investment, and management conglomerates, as well as local corporations headquartered in Atlanta, including Delta, Home Depot, Chick-fil-A, and Waffle House. Little wonder that as one former councilman put it, when the police foundation says jump, the council asks how high. The wealth and drive behind Cop City thus exceeds Koch brothers style support for a racialized security state. Motorola profiting from securitization, it exceeds lucrative building contracts, or the aim to achieve good neighbor relations between corporate entities headquartered in Atlanta and the cops. Certainly these are present, yet more important than these ideological political commitments is the fact that Georgia power, excuse me, is the fact that in the context of what Elizabeth Warren termed the legalized looting of private equity and its deep investments in Atlanta real estate development and management, to extract exorbitant returns. This is the power security nexus we need to focus on. Global capital, especially its most predatory offspring in private finance, needs a stable, well-policed investment environment. Privatized policing for private investment. The Atlanta Police Foundation is the circuit board for this double loop of privatized power. Let us see how this goes. Private equity firms, as most of you know, hold pools of investor funds operating outside public markets to acquire entities that the equity firm can then extract rents from, charge fees to, in debt, and transform. Drawing large institutional investors like universities, insurance companies, and pension funds, along with high net worth individuals, private equity promises unusually large returns on investments. With profits heavily shielded from taxation through being categorized as carried interest, private equity and their cousins, real estate investment trusts, known as REITs, are notoriously indifferent to stakeholders of their holdings, whether employees, tenants, home buyers, neighborhoods, medical patients, or small subsidiaries, all of whom they openly bleed for high returns. Just one example, over the past decade, private equity converted 65,000 single family homes at the low end of the Atlanta sales market into investment products. Snapped up with cash offers, these homes were converted to ill-maintained rentals handled by distant, often unreachable, real estate management companies. Such predations quash the dreams of would-be working and middle-class home buyers as they tighten housing supply and spike home values. These moves hit Black neighborhoods particularly hard. It's no exaggeration to frame them as a form of neo-redlining in places like Atlanta. Private equity strip mines whatever it can get its hands on, from retail and fast food franchises to healthcare systems, which it sometimes drives into the ground after milking them for profit streams under the rubric of unlocking potential through restructuring. Private equity's standard mode of operation is to acquire a company, cut costs, through union busting, layoffs, wage and benefit reductions, and to otherwise increase revenue through strategies like selling off and then renting back buildings to the entities that it owns. Or in the case of medical and dental care, nursing homes, rehab centers, by combining care stripping with unnecessary but lucrative procedures often billed to the state. Or in the case of real estate management, combining rent spikes and merciless eviction practices with building neglect. Private equity is also able to load up its acquisitions with fees and debts up to 90% of the company's value for which the company, not the investor, is responsible. So private equity often takes a perfectly healthy 
enterprise, first bleeds it dry, then sells or tips it into bankruptcy, leaving employees without severance pay and their pensions wiped out from creditor payoffs. In short, the legal protections and shell companies that private equity depends upon for its exceptional returns destroy worlds. Worlds of decently remunerated labor, affordable housing, neighborhoods, healthcare, and non-human ecologies. And they do so from a distance, with indifference, and without accountability. In short, with the help of Citizens United, the political power of this arm of finance is phenomenal. It pours billions into elections, into destroying rent control and anti-democratic spec anti-speculation campaigns, and of course, into destroying political efforts to rein in private equity itself. Private equity has in some become a mighty anti-democratic political player, as well as a ferocious economic force. Private equity and real estate investment trusts are all over Atlanta, driving expansion in tech and film, real estate and management. And private equity, and their supporting apparatuses in law and insurance are all over the Police Foundation Board. Which returns us to Cop City. The expansion and militarization of police training facilities and equipment is lucrative for companies like Motorola. It matches too with the right-wing political interests of select corporations and donors, but it is above all crucial to the rent-seeking practices of financially driven and controlled economies. And that is surely why there is so much of this power represented on the Police Foundation Board and funding the training ground. It's also why the mayor and the city council bow to the foundation's wishes, allowing both its police force and its training facilities to be effectively privatized. Bluntly, this is racialized class war taken off the public books. Privatized investment that avoids accountability while maximizing profits both parallels and is integrated with the privatization of policing to avoid the scrutiny attached to public budgets. If the outsized presence on the police foundation board of investment banks, asset managers, real estate development and management conglomerates, insurance companies and the credit bureaus, consultants and law firms this sector relies on, reminds us what's being advanced and secured, so also does a remarkable absence. There is not one community organization represented on the board, not one. There's also this, Notwithstanding the rhetoric of rising crime that public officials use to justify cop city, crime in Atlanta, apart from gun homicides, has actually declined over the past decade. There is a slightly increased homicide rate, which can be traced to unsecured guns stolen and wielded by teens, largely against one another. Only serious gun regulation could rein this in, which reframes the mayor's declaration that Cop City with its militarized training grounds is essential for a city beset by crime. Seen in the larger context of Atlanta's saturation by remote capital, tech, and real estate investment, and its already deep relationship with securitization, the training facility appears less a response to the crime rate than to producing and signaling an attractive investment climate and prepping for the racialized class wars ahead. This appearance ramifies with the intense policing and judicial crackdown on the Cop City protesters themselves. Resistance to Cop City has included sabotaging bulldozers and construction equipment, throwing objects at the police in skirmishes, vandalizing police vehicles, some defacement of banks, corporate headquarters, and even select private residences. A night of furious reaction to the killing of Tortuguita culminated in setting fire to police cars in downtown Atlanta. However, the protests have also drawn many, indeed tens of thousands, from all walks of life, who have offered surprisingly little criticism of the ecotage actions. To the contrary, an ex increasingly explicit pact 
has arisen among activists to recognize and affirm different tactical and political principles in the effort to block the project from anarchist to mainstream. The response of the city and the state, however, has been outsized in every way. Of the 36 activists arrested at the end of a music festival in March of 2023, two thirds were denied bail, 19 were charged under Georgia's domestic terrorism laws, a felony that can yield up to 30 years in prison. The assistant chief of police explained, none of these people live here. They do not have a vested interest in this property. Why is an individual from Los Angeles concerned about a training facility being built in the state of Georgia? That is why we consider it domestic terrorism. The trope of outside agitators, of course, is an old and freighted one in Southern social justice politics. It is also a politics of place, out of place in the Anthropocene. Bail has been denied to arrested activists because they had a solidarity fund leaflet for legal assistance in their, in their pockets, because they were wearing dark colored clothing or had muddy clothes. Activists holding a protest in front of a council member's house and hanging a banner on an overpass were arrested for being pedestrians on a roadway. SWAT teams have been deployed against activists handing out flyers. Outstanding parking tickets have been used as pretexts for arrest. A warrant to raid a large encampment of protesters in April listed lighters, tents, camping equipment, spray paint cans, and political pamphlets as items establishing probable cause for evidence of conspiracy to commit domestic terrorism. In May 2021, leafleters in downtown Atlanta were jailed for felony intimidation of an officer because the leaflet named and pictured an officer who shot Tortuguita. Later that month, a phalanx of Atlanta police and Georgia Bureau of Investigation officers raided a community center that served as a home for community organizers. They arrested three Atlanta Solidarity Fund workers on specious allegations of charity fraud and money laundering. The assistant attorney general demanded pre-trial detention of the organizers for what he called their virulent anti-establishment beliefs. And while their lawyers were preparing their case for bail, the organizers were incarcerated in the most dangerous jail in the city. One remains incarcerated 14 months later. Then in early September of last year, the attorney general charged 61 forest protesters with RICO violations. These are the 1970s US laws designed to capture mafia racketeering and which carry jail sentences of up to 20 years. The indictment devotes 25 pages to vilifying the Defend the Atlanta Forest Group as, quote, an anti-government, anti-police, and anti-corporate extremist organization. In short, it indicts an entire movement whose beginnings it identifies with Black Lives Matter, protests that commenced a full year before plans for Cop City were announced and the resistance to it organized. The indictment names everything from mutual aid, raising bail money and flyer distribution to collectivist beliefs as hallmarks of conspiracy to commit crimes. The absence of cell phones amidst arrested protesters wearing the same color clothes, these too have been deemed markers of conspiracy by the state of Georgia. In December 2023, the city launched a $200,000 reward campaign for information about any saboteurs related to the forest protection. And in February, 2024, the FBI joined forces with Georgia and Atlanta police for a SWAT style pre-dawn raid of three homes where activists live. These are policing and judicial practices intended to destroy protest, not contain or regulate it. But it's not only direct action that's being repressed. Every kind of retardant has also been poured on the fires of participatory democratic efforts to stop Cop City. Testimony at public hearings has been repeatedly ignored, and at the last one, hundreds of attendees were prevented from signing up to speak. 
for a signature-based referendum filed in December 2023 with nearly twice the signatures required, the city hired expensive corporate legal counsel, first to delay and encumber the referendum, and then to try to invalidate it in advance. The mayor denounced the referendum, itself an emblem of democratic voice, and declared it could have no bearing whatsoever on the city's contract with the Atlanta Police Foundation. And those residents of unincorporated DeKalb County, facing the potential exchange of forest for the sights and sounds of gunfire, speeding cop cars, detonating bombs. In early summer 2023, they sued the city and state in federal court for the right to collect signatures for the referendum, arguing simply that because they live adjacent to the site, they ought to be able to participate in the process. Atlanta, the birthplace of the civil rights movement, has done everything imaginable to keep this neighborhood disenfranchised. What does this movement suggest for reparative democracy? First, the obvious. On one side is the mangled forest, the poor, the black, the indigenous, the young, histories of violence, exploitation, and exclusion. On the other side, large capital and its props, law and risk management firms, security tech, a weaponized judiciary and carceral state, largely bought elected representatives. The reparative politics of Stop Cop City itself transpire on what Annette Singh calls a patch teeming with damaged life. Histories of indigenous dispossession, black slavery, contemporary racialized poverty, blatant political disenfranchisement, along with heavily co-opted black political power and exceptionally predatory finance. The movement resists not just deforestation, but the double punch of a militarized police training facility adjacent to neglected underrepresented neighborhoods already traumatized by racialized policing. The movement braids these together as it braids together protection of non-human and human ecologies. It repairs from the exclusions of politica bound to culture nature divides at the heart of Western democracy. Even as most identify as anarchists, the forest protectors in particular have reworked constituent elements of democracy in a reparative frame. As the protectors live both in and off the forest, were protected by it and sought to protect it, they recast the demos as both less exclusively human and more interdependent than is possible in a liberal democratic lexicon. Those who in turn support the protectors with legal assistance, mutual aid, bond funds, food, medicine, therapy, and more, they are also part of this recasting. They protect the protectors who protect the forest that protects all life. The Defend the Atlanta Forest Movement also features every kind of citizen activist. From the former federal prosecutor under Trump, who developed the legal strategy for the ballot referendum, she self-describes as a privileged white lady with two corgis, to Atlanta Black Lives Matter and abolition activists, to community and union organizers, to trans tree sitters with names like Ferngrove and Wisteria, to military vets deeply opposed to militarizing American police forces because they have seen close up the nightmare of militarized policing elsewhere. Second, the fight against Cop City illuminates power at what Foucault calls the extreme points of its exercise, where he reminded us, power inevitably surmounts the rules of right that organize and delimit it, and is always less legal in character. It also reveals entwinements of economic, juridical and police power from those extremes. The potency of privatization and liberal orders for enabling and masking those entwinements and the threat to the forest and its protectors that are its effects. But entwinement is not the same as centralization and we need to keep the king's head cut off to feature reparative democracy in place of existing forms. Few of the powers that stop cop city protesters fight legitimately govern. 
even as they harness and saturate legitimate governing to complete the bankruptcy of actually existing democracy as they bend formal governing to its will. The fight for the forest viscerally encounters and exposes this infiltration. Corruption, public power turned to private ends, is inadequate to what is normalized in this story. Increasingly privatized public power that matches increasingly privatized social and state functions and increasingly privatized finance of state projects themselves. This reminds us why seeds of reparative democracy must often be planted outside formal political venues. Finally, through protest, occupation, education, and some monkey wrench ganging, this resistance expresses a reparative orientation toward past and future, human and non-human life, the dispossessed, disregarded, unrepresented, and unmoneyed. It is not itself democracy, and not only because some of the activists are anarchists, rather as a demotic uprising that does not seek to govern the complex powers and problems of the 21st century, it is more demos than kratia, more insurgency than rule. But it calls for a politics that serves life rather than managing or damaging it, that features the interdependence of human and non-human life and carries a reparative rather than exploitative orientation toward the histories, conditions of existence and futures for both human and non-human life. Here is where reparative democracy may take shape for a while as critique, as resistance and as call for alternatives it does not yet know how to bring into being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown, for a fascinating presentation. Uh, I have many questions. And I imagine that uh, people in the audience will have many questions as well. So let's open the floor uh, for questions, please. Uh, write your questions in the chat or raise your hand the real or the virtual. Uh, in either case, please be brief so to, to give uh, other people time for questions as well. Um, so we have a question in the chat. Um, Mariana, uh, so from Mariana from Puerto Rico, um, She's grateful for this meeting and uh, she says, I believe that the concept of a state nation is crucial to the creation of false modernity. I have a question for Professor Brown. Is it possible to establish a reparative democracy within the state nation as political entity or instead, is it necessary to abolish it first, uh, to abolish the state to create a uh, another world war? Um, it's, it's an important question, thank you. Um, I, I don't think we can wait to build reparative democratic projects for uh, a time when we abolish the state <laughs> um, or the nation state or make um, spaces formally that are beyond it or subtended by it. That said, Part of what I'm trying to suggest about reparative democracy is that it is emerging from something that many of us have been charting for a while, which is the exhaustion of the nation state form, which, which exhaustion doesn't mean the nation state is over, but it does mean it's rickety, it's violent, it's, it's, it's in various kinds of death throes, which can be um, very dangerous. Um, but reparative democracy, I, I, as I'm formulating it, and as I'm drawing on others who are practicing it, um, is taking all kinds of forms apart from the nation state. Um, these include very local forms, but they include as well transnational solidaristic forms um, that, that, as it were, uh, leave the question of the nation state to one side while trying to produce 
a reparative democratic set of protests or politics or demands uh, that in, do indeed violate conventional nation state orders. Thank you, uh, Professor. So, Elena, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Wendy, for a uh, hey, Elena. Know, hi, hi, for a fabulous um, paper, and you know, like I'm sort of still thinking with you. Yeah, I'm not going to ask why why not anarchism. So I will I leave that aside. Um, but I, I am interested. I, I became more and more interested um, in what economies. Yeah, and I don't mean what what alternative economies can we build. Mm -hmm support um um this this reparative um de democracies or demos that you you are talking about uh, out and we see they they live parallel to this terrible uh corporate world that we we, we inhabit and I, i'm partly convinced by kind of following some sort of historical stuff that the idea of the um uh cooperative or, or co cooperative it, it's one way and I wonder whether you have any other suggestions yourself great do you mind if I answer the why not anarchist question no, <laughs> not at all not at all it's, I, everyone's always curious um I'm, I'm it's it's a pretty simple answer which is that um for me uh the 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 best part of the democratic promise um, is is not contained in liberalism. It's contained in in the in the founding notion of the term, which is the people rule. Mm -hmm. And what I've tried to suggest is um, we're going to have to do something about the people part, and we're going to have to transform some of what we understand by ruling. But I am still invested. I remain invested in the prospect of us controlling the powers that we generate rather than just unleashing them in the world. I think that is our only hope. And anarchism does not contain that thread. It has many other features. And I think we can blend certain aspects of anarchist thought and practice into what I'm insisting must remain some kind of commitment to um, us governing and ruling ourselves and doing it with the rest of planetary life, and I'm willing later to talk about how we do that, which I didn't discuss here at all. Um, but it's um, it it it's not present in anarchism that idea of governing ourselves, ruling ourselves, and all the complexities and difficulties and challenges that that entails. So that's the answer to the question you said you didn't want to ask, <laughs> and, um, but we're all curious about. And then there's the question about alternative. Um, I think you put it as alternate economies. And yes, I mean, cooperatives, obviously, various kinds of localism that honor the capacity humans have to work well with um, uh, their, their own talents and their capacity to work with others. At the same time, we honor uh, all of the non-human life that sustains us. Uh, that cannot be done from high above. It has to be done very close to the ground. On the other hand, I'm not naive enough to think that we can put globalization fully back in the bottle. We can't. We know that. I'm hoping that we can figure out how to get finance off the face of the planet because that does nobody any good. But the interconnectedness of um, peoples everywhere and the distribution of productivity productivity and production that that has entailed uh, is not going to go away. So I think, you know, at best, what we're looking toward is forms of local control and, and, and local cooperation and local cooperatives that are integrated in some fashion with uh, a more democratized form of social production globally. Now that's, you know, that's a big tall order, but I think that's where our hopes need to go if we are 21st century anti-capitalists. Is that good enough for now? Okay. Do we have any other question? Yeah, Sara, yes. Sara? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, 
for that talk. I just, I've, it's prompted so much thinking um, and I found it really useful on a lot of fronts. So I have a question. It's not entirely well formulated, so apologies. Um, but I was thinking a lot about the use of the term reparative mm -hmm. rather than something like transformative. And mm -hmm. I was, because so much of what you taught, I was thinking about how ab prison abolitionists have a long critique of restorative justice for its desire to return things to the status quo rather than use harm as an opportunity to kind of challenge the conditions that led to that harm in the first place and change them. And so I was interested because it seems that the way in which you're invoking the notion of reparative justice has lots of that element of it, but you're using repair in a really different way, I think, than, and, you know, as you set out, it was different from restitution and different from, I think in some ways different from kind of restorative models of justice. And I just wondered if you could say like more about that and whether this is like, is this more of a semantic question or do you think there's something really important as transformative hail back to a kind of too utopian revolutionary politic where repair holds something different or yeah, I guess if you could yeah. just say a little bit more about what right. work think reparative does as yeah. opposed to something like transformative. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, this is uh, exploratory work for me. It's still early days with the book. And, um, you know, I've written lots of pieces of it, but I keep rethinking it in relation to questions like yours. So this is super helpful for me. Um, I have chosen reparative in partly because of the extent to which I have been immersed in ecological politics literatures over the past several years. And as I said at the beginning, one of the things that becomes clear to you once you immerse yourself in this stuff is that um, there is no restoration, but there's also no radical transformation. And that doesn't mean there isn't a radical political set of possibilities ahead, but um, we're not just as we're not going to put globalization back in the bottle. Climate change is not going to recede in any way, and neither is biodiversity loss. We all know it's going to get worse and worse. The question is, how do we orient ourselves politically to repairing what is possible, grieving what has to be grieved, and um, orienting toward a world in which we are reparative both in relation to the damages to human life that capitalist modernity, colonial modernity, whatever you name you want to give it, fossil modernity has done, but also ecological life. And I do think, you know, transformative is fine, but it doesn't bring the past into the struggle for a future in the same way. It doesn't recognize, for me, in my, in my hearing of the lexicon, it doesn't recognize that we're not going to rid ourselves of what the ecologists call the residuals. You know, we're not going to, the, the soil is not going to get radically cleaned up. The ocean is not going to get cleared of nanoplastics. The, the, the climate is not going to suddenly cool and chill again. Um, we're, but, but, and we, we, we have to work with that, not just moan about it. And we have to do our best uh, to repair it, as well as the, all the damage in the form of colonialism and, and inequality that this, I'm gazing at your beautiful cat, sorry, we all are, the cat's behind you. Um, <laughs> um, it, we, have to, uh, we, we have to orient ourselves toward uh, uh, repairing the past into the future in a way that I don't think transformation carries for me. So I'm not against the abolitionist notion of radical rethinking and thinking differently than obviously restitution or restoration. Reparative for me does not go in that direction in the way that I've been deploying it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's great. Can I maybe add a question that is actually related to Sarah's uh, question right. about uh, transformative justice and the difference with reparation because you know, for me, it's fascinating that you are trying to bring this idea of reparations to democratic theory, uh, particularly because we could say that reparations, or at least the, the main or original, you know, strand of reparations emerged in the 1980s, 
uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall as a kind of technology to go with post-conflict, post-dictatorial yeah. or traditional scenarios. Yeah. And it went hand in hand with the emergence of the human rights discourse at the at the same time. I mean, the, the liberal, uh, mainstream liberal discourse that we have today. Mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but what is interesting about reparations is, is that this very kind of technical discourse was then taken by activists, right, to claim reparations in the context of slavery, uh, colonialism, the subjugation of indigenous peoples, uh, and so on. So in other words, what emerged as a kind of top-down technocratic device became politicized mm -hmm. when activists started claiming reparations in a new context, in new contexts, in new idioms, and so on. Now, my, my concern you know, is, is the following. Before talking about reparations, we were talking about revolution, right? Before the Berlin Wall, <laughs> the fall of the Berlin Wall. So seen from this perspective, the reparations discourse is pretty conservative, even counter-revolutionary, I would say, as it borne out precisely as a way to appease victims without changing the political or economic structure that produce or enable that victimization in the first place. I, I'm talking about the, the, the original kind of, you know. Uh, Agreed, uh, yeah. Reparations. So, uh, so in a way, reparations, you know, could be seen as part of what you describe as the you know, liberal economy, economization of every aspect of life, right? Because, you know, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a form of calculation, right? It's a, a form of, calculate, uh, of calculating uh, suffering and loss in a way. And to put and to you know try to repair historical wrongs in the framework of that calculation. Uh, so I don't know. I, I guess that I, I would like to highlight the paradoxes of reparations and bring them closer to your your analysis. Your analysis, your past analysis of neoliberalism, are more particularly to also to your critique of rights, right? So if you are a victim, I would say that you know uh, reparations are that which you cannot not want. Like what you know that uh, what uh, Spivak says about about rights. Still, when seen globally, reparations might be more paradoxical than originally thought. So, you know, uh, I, I wonder if you have you know um, uh, any thoughts about this. Uh, I, I wonder if you can speak about the lights and shadows of of reparations, and if you agree with me that reparations might have some problematic aspects as well, or the, or the reparation framework might have some problematic aspects as well. I completely agree with you, Alexis. And it's why I tried to distinguish reparations from the term reparative. And it's hard because reparations are everywhere in our political and legal vocabulary now. And as soon as I say reparative, people think reparations. And what I was trying to suggest is that in addition to all of the problems you just named with reparations, um, they are fundamentally distributive in relation to the past. They are not an orientation toward a future, an ongoing future of repair. They make possible a future for those who have been severely damaged that might be different than if they weren't, as it were, paid off, um, lifted in some way. So they're not nothing, but they have all the problems that you've suggested and they have very little to do with an orientation toward being human on this planet that reckons with the histories of damage that will continue into the future that demand that we be reparative unto the end of time. There's no end, there's no time when we're done with, with, with being reparative given what modernity unleashed. And that's very disappointing to many people. I, you, it, what I find shocking is how many liberals, not just radicals and revolutionaries, really want an open future in which we can leave behind the disasters and make the world better anew from, from a kind of tabula rasa. But you know we know better than that now. We know it ecologically, we know it politically, we know it geographically, we know it in every way. We, we don't vanquish the damages from psyche and soul to mountaintops, to rivers and oceans, 
to, to whole uh, existences uh, now in regions that are too parched to sustain life anymore or any any other version of, of climate and biodiversity damage that you want to discuss. So um, what I'm suggesting about reparative that's, that separates it so sharply from reparations is that it's not a payoff about a past. It's an engagement collectively with a past with which we never took responsibility for up to this moment and now must if we're to make a different future. Because the only way to make a different future is to have a reparative orientation toward those damages of the past that linger into the future. And that creates a very different temporality between past, present, and future than reparations do. It also creates a very different spatiality um, because it can't ever be limited to one group of damaged people. It's, it's about, that's why I'm so drawn to Annette Singh's notion of patches. It's, a, it's about spaces and places with imbricated damage that are, that are not just about picking out the victimized and paying them off. So I thank you for the question only because it allowed me to go further in separating what I'm doing from reparations. And some people have suggested, oh, you should just give up the, the language of reparative democracy, call it something else. It's always going to sound like reparations. It's always going to sound like repair. And um, I might, but I, I'm, 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 I'm not, I haven't found a, a better way to talk about it yet, but I might. We have many questions in the chat. Uh, so Shailan uh, Vegun says, um, in reference to Professor Brown, Professor Brown's uh, previous works on finding the man in the state, I wonder if there is a gender-based observation slash relation in practice of reparative democracy. I also have in mind the distinction between SOE uh, and VIOS, uh, mm -hmm. and exclusion of SOE from political life in Greek democracy. Great. Um, yes. So, of course, there has to be a gendered dimension to repair politics. Um, what many have suggested is, oh, Wendy, you're just describing care work on a grand scale. <laughs> um, you're, you're describing the displacement of extraction and exploitation um, with uh, a practice of, of uh, democratic rule and democratic principles that are fundamentally grounded in care. If you want, you can have that. Um, that would be one way of gendering it. I think there there will be others as well that have to do with um, recognizing that what I offered in a very quick uh, set of brushstrokes today about the ancient Greek origins of democracy, separating the city from the from the outside lands, the free from the unfree, the the you know the the ten percent who are citizens from the slaves and the women and all of that. That, that those separations that I suggest endure in certain ways, even if not in those formal ways, but endure in the sense that democracy is always human-centered, it's always about rule that is not necessarily about all the forms of life, reproducing it, sustaining it, generating that take place in households, that take place in all kinds of zones and scenes that are not necessarily exclusively human, that's part of the legacy that I'm challenging that I have in the past, as uh, Ceylon rightly points out, named a masculinist legacy. So yes, that's the gender dimension. Uh, and of course, the distinction between Zoe and Bios is also one of the ones I'm trying to take apart. Great. Uh, so we have uh, a question uh, from Shivani. Uh, how do you think about right-wing governments and states draw drawing upon select understandings of local historical cultural and the injustices therein to actually stre uh, strengthen their own agendas mm. through an active process of othering? Okay, I think I understand this. Um, I'm looking for it in the chat, but I'm not finding it. Shivani, would you like to maybe clarify? Your oh, there question? she is. I see her. How do you think about right-wing governments? Oh, oh, like the uh, the appropriation of the local. 
and the even the indigenous and uh, the traditional, cultural, historical. Is that what is that Shivani? What you're the 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 exploitation of that by right wing governments to secure their power, right? To kind of you know adopt co opt the local histories or the sense of injustices, but yeah. not for the purpose of reparation or transformation, but yeah. then further their agendas of other interests. Beautiful. Okay. So, you know, you share this with us at this point, Shivani. I mean, it's in Millet, it's in Trump. This is this is exactly how that power gets. I mean, whether it's explicit or whether it's kind of tacit in the discourse, it's happening everywhere. So, um, you know, there are many ways to think about this at the level of critique. What I want to suggest is that we think about it at the level of left strategy um, and think, okay, how how can we get in there? How can we engage those same peoples and practices and, um, as it were, traditions and anxieties, um, as opposed to simply yielding them, seeding them, saying, oh, okay, I guess they're all reactionaries because they followed Millet or they followed Trump or they followed Maloney or whatever. Um, that It didn't have to go that way. There are anxieties and fears and concerns about destroyed ways of life that we must be able to offer an alternative vision to that's both realistic and compelling. And, you know, in my country, at least, the left hasn't been very good at either one. Well, we tend to yell a lot. We, we tend to thump the desk a lot about, you know, what we think justice is and what we think ought to, who is do what. And we don't think very hard about what is what could be compelling to people who have become anxious, fearful about absolute erosion or destruction of ways of life, whether it's traditional family or religion or agricultural practices or small villages or anything else. The left should have never ceded that territory um, at all, but we did, so now we have to fix it. Um, we, we need to develop you know, visions of, would you like to control your own life? Here's how we can do it. It's it's not from, you know, Millet's not really going to let you do that. He's he's exploiting you. Here's how you can control your own life. Here are the practices we can build. Here are the cooperatives we can use to resist some of the most predatory behaviors of capital today. Here are the legal protections we need. Here's, you know, we need to be concrete and realistic at the same time we're radical and visionary. And you know, we know that. We know that about the left, and we just need to get better at it. Uh, so we have a, another question from Sara, who is a lawyer from Argentina. Mm. And uh, she's wondering about uh, the role of... Uh, she, she says that, the, 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 that education in democracy is very important, education uh, in relation to... To some of the topics you address about, for example, the the exploitation of nature and the 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 um, the yeah mainly the exploitation of nature, she mentions that um, she uh, participated with some citizens to save a, a, a huge forest from mm -hmm. a real estate investment in Argentina in Paraná. So she was wondering about the role of of education in democracy. Uh, uh, is asking you, what do you think about this role of education? Yeah, it's everything. I mean, the, the, the best strategy that the right ever came up with was to destroy the public universities and um, or to convert them into vocational schools where you don't learn much. Um, and now uh, in my country, they're moving on to the primary schools and the secondary schools, trying to control the curriculums, destroy serious education. Um, nothing is more important, especially at this moment in history when it is impossible to intuitively understand a whole host of global powers and forces. You actually need education to be able to understand what is happening to the planet, what finance capital is, how the inter interconnection between what um, Katerina Pister calls the code of capital, 
the legal structure for capital and capital operates. It's not visible. It's not on the surface. It's not intuitive. We're not in little islands where we can kind of see the whole picture of who we are and what we do and what we interact with and what we live off. Globalization has made that more difficult, but so is simply the complexity of contemporary powers. So it's never been more important to have strong, interdisciplinary forms of knowledge taught to every human being. And it has never been more difficult to hold on to that practice of education. So, you know, Sarah, I'm preaching to the choir, I think. Uh, I, I, my own work for the past 15 years has been very much dedicated, my own activist work has been very much dedicated to trying to save public universities in the, in the United States context uh, from being fully privatized and fully vocationalized, which is to say turned into simply pre-professional or professional programs where you don't learn anything except what you need for your job. Uh, so a question from Christine Cooper, uh, she says, well, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I was really interested in your comment about getting rid of finance. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you, given, uh, the extraordinary powerful big four accounting forms embedded within the state and private equity. Do you have any thoughts about how you begin to, to even, to even think about, uh, this challenge? Um, I'm going to lean on a couple of my colleagues here at the Institute this year. Um, I have the good fortune to have uh, the colleagueship of Daniela Gabor, whom some of you may follow on Twitter. Um, and her, her main project is what she calls fighting de-risking, which is the practice of states increasingly to depend on private finance for public projects which they do by getting rid of the risk, essentially subsidizing the risk of private finance with taxpayer funds. It's, it's one of the worst scams in, in modern history, and it's become absolutely ubiquitous. And what Gabor and others suggest is that if states simply stop doing this, they would already begin to regain a notion and a practice of public projects that are in the public interest, that are for the public good, whether it's infrastructure or decarbonizing or uh, producing you know, renewable energy, all of the things that you know, are long overdue and uh, desperately needed if we're gonna have any chance of a future. Um, and what I wanna suggest is that, although that's not, that's not about getting rid of finance, if it if 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 the if there were if there were a reversal in de-risking, if if de-risking were ceased as a practice, and if finance was required um, to be subordinated actually by the political as opposed to controlling the political, if if we got finance back underneath where it belongs, that's already a politicization of a domain that is not politicized now. That that would serve the form of education. I mean, it would educate people about what states have been in hawk to and what they need to do instead. But it also begins to put the very idea of public goods for public purposes back into the political agenda as opposed to the endless desire to attract private finance or even public finance from private sources. So it's not a very, I'm not giving you a revolutionary project. I'm giving you an incre incremental project. Um, I don't know if, I mean, one can imagine getting rid of finance capital if one got rid of capital altogether, but I'm not sure how useful that imaginary is as opposed to trying to figure out how to get the thing back in harness and reveal it as the enormous political and economically damaging power that it is um, and transform it through essentially, I mean, what I'm talking about in part is kind of nationalizing it. We can maybe take one last question. Okay.
okay if there is i can maybe ask the last question if i help yourself well it, it relates to to one thing that you said uh, you mentioned during your presentation several times uh latour and you know he has a proposal for a kind of integration of non-humans to yeah. the democracy which is the the parliament of things and so on but i was wondering about your 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 take on this how how you envision the integration of non-humans into this yeah. uh, reparative democracy you know rights are one of the of the the most popular or trendy uh, yeah. options nowadays yeah. Uh, and I know that because you have all your position about rights, maybe that that I have a question about that. But, you know, I was wondering in general, how do you envision that kind of integration? I'm not against them. Um, I'm not against rights for the non-human. Um, I think they're they're limited in effect. I mean, you know, you all in Latin America have plenty of examples of attempts to constitutionalize nature that are destroyed the moment big oil comes along and offers a good enough deal. Um, and yet, you know, that it, again, it has served an educative and politicizing function that is not nothing. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not hardcore about being, I'm not against rights of nature. However, my, my idea at this point in, in a reparative democratic framework is that humans coming to understand, let's put it this way, coming to have a profound consciousness of our deep dependency on all of earthly life and one another are already in a position to begin to act differently as humans than they are when we don't regard the earth that way and when we don't regard one another that way. And so it will sound strange, Alexis, but I've actually gone back to Heidegger on listening <laughs> and thinking about what listening can be as a social democratic practice where instead of just listening to one another, when I said the voiced and the unvoiced must count equally, we're listening for the presence or the absence of the birds, the presence or the absence of terrible, fierce, out of season storms that signal to us what's going on at the level of climate change or listening to the presence or the absence or the, as it were, the voices that we otherwise think we don't understand. And so I'm not suggesting that a picture of uh, the polis in which all kinds of critters are in there doing their yammering away. I'm suggesting a picture of the polis in which human beings are so transformed by what we understand, our own dependencies and nourishment and regeneration are, are reliant on um, that we ourselves represent ourselves, uh, represent life differently than we do now. I know that sounds a bit esoteric and metaphysical, and I'm trying to work it out in a much more concrete way, um, but that's, that's where I'm going here. It's not against rights, but it's a recognition that as long as the creatures that have rights can't actually defend their rights in court, which they cannot, um, they're going to lose too often. Esoteric is great, you know. It's great too. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you know, I'm only apologizing because I know some people hear all this and think, wait, wait, how does that actually work? And I, I have some very strong feelings and ideas about how it actually works, but I, I truncated it and I, I want to suggest, of course, we combine the esoteric and the highly theoretical with uh, urgent attention to this world and what kind of theory and esotericism it needs. And that's how we generate new possibility. Amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Our time is up, unfortunately. Uh, thank you again, Professor Brown, for, for joining us today. Uh, it was a fascinating presentation and conversation. Uh, thank you also to the members of the group of critical studies in Buenos Aires, especially to, to Marcelo Rafin. Uh, thank you, Gul Katun from the Q Queen Mary events team. I don't know if you are still still there. Thank you so much for for your support, and thank you all for for joining us today. 
Uh, please join us uh, again for the next uh, session of the talk series on May 29. Uh, you can find the link, the link to the to the event in the chat. Uh, we'll have Professor Samuel Moyne, uh, who will talk about uh, reconstructing critical legal studies. So hope to see you then. And thank you again to everyone uh, for being here today. Thank you. Bye.